All right, members, we now move on to questions to the Minister for the Economy. I call uh, Rosemary Barton to ask the first question. Ms Barton. Thank you. Minister, question one. I call the Minister for the Economy. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, Mr Speaker, uh, with your permission, uh, I would like to group together questions 1 and 10 and uh, I'd also to avail of a, an additional minute uh, for answering the question. So can I thank the members for their questions on this very important issue. While my department is responsible for higher education policy in relation to teaching and research in Northern Ireland, student accommodation, whether it is university halls of residence or private rental housing, is a matter between the individual student and their landlord. Whilst my department has no, uh, no remit or legal basis for determining whether students should receive a refund or reduction of their accommodation fees as a result of the disruption uh, caused by the COVID pandemic, I do recognise the very difficult position many students find themselves in as a result of the COVID restrictions. I have therefore been examining ways in which to provide additional levels of support, speaking with the student loan company to investigate whether they could deliver payments to all Northern Ireland students. I have written also to local universities to encourage them to widen the criteria for assessing hardship, and I have spoken to the Vice-Chancellors of both Queen's and Ulster to reiterate my commitment to making more funds available for student hardship support. I am pleased to see our university is taking some steps to support students who have uh, experienced difficulties with their accommodation contracts. My department through the universities continues to provide support to any students who are facing uh, financial hardship for whatever reason, including difficulties uh, with their accommodation contracts. In recognition of these difficulties and the ongoing impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, I have indicated to the Finance Minister that I will be seeking additional funding, uh, increasing the total amount that will be available for student hardship in the current financial year. I have also instructed the universities to publicise and promote the availability of these additional funds to ensure that they reach eligible students as quickly as possible and to consider whether any requirements set by their institutions for students to access funds can be relaxed or removed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I call that Rosemary Barton supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. Minister, you talked about seeking additional funding for the student for student hardship. That's very well and very fine, but many students have had difficulty meeting the criteria for this student hardship fund. And in particular, when they've had trouble with their with the private student accommodation, accommodation providers. And they have already signed contracts and they can't get out of these contracts. Minister, what conversations have you had with uh, the private student accomm accommodation providers uh, who are unable to get out of these contracts? Can I thank uh, the member again for her question? The member will uh, recognise that um, the contract between um, the student and a private landlord is uh, a matter uh, for them uh, and is legally binding between them. However, um, just this morning, uh, in fact, I spoke again to the Vice Chancellors of both Queen's and Ulster and indicated to them that uh, there is additional funding available for hardship funding, that that funding needs to be available for um, those students who are um, having increasing difficulties uh, with their rental contracts um, because they have been unable, to, for example, to seek um, additional um, employment and um, part-time employment that students would normally have during this uh, period of time. Um, so I would hope um, that in the reasonably near future we would be able to bring forward a fuller paper uh, in relation to this uh, issue uh, and will revert to the member in due course. I call Mark Durgan. Uh, Kian and I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Listening to the many students who have been in contact with the SDLP 
The student hardship does not, fund does not seem fit for purpose. The eligibility criteria is restrictive, the process arduous and the waiting time very lengthy. Does the Minister agree that we need a dedicated COVID-19 student support fund that gets money out fast and directly into the pockets of those who need it? It's our view we needed this eight months ago and students desperately need it now. Again, can I thank the member uh, for his question. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that I have learnt um, in all of the uh, funds that we have administered uh, within the department, and those have been a, a very wide-ranging um, number of funds, is that we don't need to replicate, uh, but rather use more effectively what is already there. Um, and with that in mind, as I said this morning, I was uh, speaking to both the vice chancellors uh, of uh, Queen's uh, and Ulster, um, urging them to bring forward to proposals as to how they might look at the eligibility um, for the existing hardship fund, how that might be improved to ensure that students have greater knowledge of it, greater access to it, and that we will be making uh, further funding available to them um, on this particular issue. Last week, I also wrote um, to the vice chancellors at Queen's um, and uh, Ulster and reminded them um, of their uh, duty to ensure that students um, have access to these funds that have uh, been made available um, within uh, Northern Ireland. I also reminded them that they should review their compliance with consumer uh, protection law in relation to the way that courses are being offered and the levels of fees uh, that are being charged. Um, they have assured me this morning that they will be following up on my letter to them, but I want to make it clear to universities that they need to be clear up front with their students as to the, the teaching and the type uh, of teaching that each one will have uh, as they go through university in what has been a really difficult, difficult year for many students. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Speaker, for letting me in. Minister, over the weekend, um, our party put out a, a survey for students to see how they felt they were impacted by this pandemic. 75% of them have said that they are really, really badly affected in terms of finance. Also, 50% have said that they're paying for accommodation that they're not living in. But very harrowingly, 94% said that it's affecting their mental well-being. And that, to me, is something that we all have to sit up straight and take, take on board. Minister, your colleague, in uh, the Welsh Government has put together a £40 million support package for students. This is on top of um, the, the, the Student Hardship Fund. An additional £10 million was put into the Student Hardship Fund. I think we need something of that magnitude. I think just feeding the Student Hardship Fund um, as it stands now is not good enough. This has to be an all-student support fund um, that helps all of our young people. Thank you. The member raises a really important uh, question and one which has um, been um, communicated to me as a constituency MLA um, and also as minister and one which I spoke specifically this morning to the vice chancellors about. All of them report increased demand for mental health services for young people who feel under significant levels of stress, either through uh, financial hardship or just uh, the remoteness of the way that their course is being taught, etc. Um, I have asked um, the universities to look again at their provision for mental health on campus and bring me proposals that would add to the provision for those young people uh, while they are um, students at university here in Northern Ireland. And we will do our best to make sure that we uh, meet those needs as identified by the universities. And indeed, I hope to have a conversation later on in the week with uh, student representatives as well. This is an extremely important issue um, that has, um, I think, been exacerbated um, because of the COVID uh, restrictions. 
I could uh, list uh, the interventions that we have already made in relation to additional help uh, for higher uh, education, including uh, an uplift in the number of students. Um, and uh, that was before we had the uplift for those um, uh, additional requirements after A levels, additional support for part time uni uh, the open university, providing um, a safer environment uh, and taking into account COVID restrictions, additional money for research and development, additional funding of over two million for the postgraduate award scheme. The additional funding that we've given for the COVID Rapid Response Research and Innovation Funding, the student support loans uh, that we've currently um, done, that and more uh, will be required. And as I say, I'm committed to bringing forward that paper to the executive. I call John O'Dowd. I agree with Ken Crowley and thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Minister, you'll be aware that over this last number of months, on behalf of Sinn Féin, I've been raising this issue with you. The Student Hardship Fund is not fit for the purpose a task in terms of compensating our students in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. I note your comments that uh, you do not want to replicate the system, but you want to get the money out the door. So if the Student Hardship Fund is going to be used, then you have to ensure that it is going to compensate our students for rent for accommodation they are not using. In relation to the student loans, I welcome the fact that you are now engaging with the student loan company and that students hopefully now will be compensated for their fees. But there is going to have to be a substantial amount of money bid for, because students and their hard-pressed families cannot afford another false dawn. Minister, will you commit to ensure that the package you bring forward is fit for purpose and does compensate our students? And can I also add, we also have to remember our higher education colleges, our further education colleges as well. Um. I will start with the last one first, because um, one of the things that um, we are accused of is always focusing on universities. And there are a significant number of young people and students of all ages who do their degrees or their foundation courses through our further education colleges. And of course, anything that we will do um, will be uh, replicated um, there as well. And it is very important to say that. Um, Again, I will reiterate that I um, was, have been speaking with the two vice chancellors. Um, I have asked them to work with my officials to look at how we can get more funding out through the Student uh, Hardship Fund and make that available to students uh, in Northern Ireland. I have had a conversation uh, with the student loan company. Um, I must say, um, not the most fruitful of conversations, but we will continue to pursue that conversation to see is there a mechanism there whereby uh, we can uh, help students in this most difficult uh, of years. And of course, um, I have also um, told universities and reminded them of their um, requirements under consumer protection law uh, to um, work uh, with students, provide clear information to students as to how their course is delivered and to see if they and ensure themselves that they are providing value for money to each young student in Northern Ireland. I call Rachel Wood. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister if, um, in any review of the support for students, if she intends to negotiate with universities to allow tenancies in universities to be terminated without notice or without penalty? This was part of our conversation this morning. My understanding is that for those young people um, who have asked, um, Queen's have offered uh, to um, allow them a holiday from their, um, their um, accommodation fees. This originally was up to the end of January, but the Vice-Chancellor there assures me that this will be up uh, until the restrictions end, but I have asked them to look at that again. I understand that Ulster have taken a slightly different approach of looking at this on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and uh, I've asked them to review that as well and to come forward with proposals. Moving on, I call Paul Frew. Mr. Speaker, question number two. Uh, 
The north-south uh, interconnector would increase the capacity to transfer electricity into Northern Ireland and reduce the risk to Northern Ireland electricity consumers of insufficient generation supply to meet demand. Pressure on maintaining security of supply can be affected by a range of factors, including low wind, resulting in reduced renewable generation, thermal plant generator outages due to maintenance or repair, and traded export of electricity to Great Britain through the Moyle interconnector. Northern Ireland has a relatively small electricity network with a limited number of thermal power stations and there is a greater risk of loss of supply than would be the case in a large and highly interconnected system where a large number of power stations can depend upon each other for support in the event uh, of of uh, unforeseen disturbances. The electricity transmission network operates on an all-island basis. However, there is currently only one high-capacity interconnector linking both jurisdictions. This reduces, restricts the amount of electricity that can flow from north to south to support security of supply. North-South interconnection is therefore critical to ensuring electricity security of supply for Northern Ireland electricity consumers in the long term. Supplementary, Paul Frew. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her uh, answer. Uh, and whilst I agree that interconnection in general is very, very good because it adds flexibility, it can also cause issues, especially in our environment, whereby Airgrid owns Sony and are quite aggressive around governance issues. In 2013, the NLLS, which is the No Load Loss Sharing Policy, was changed without any consultation or explicit approval by the utility regulator or the department. It was re reduced to only 100 megawatts, which means that in stress or alert positions of low capacity, where both jurisdictions will be struggling, but the Republic of Ireland more so because of data centres, uh, they can then suck power from Northern Ireland, leaving us very vulnerable. Can the minister undertake to investigate this matter? I do take um, all of these issues very uh, seriously and recognise the danger that there is uh, to uh, supply in Northern Ireland. In recent weeks, as the, I know the member is aware, there have been a number of amber alerts in Northern Ireland driven by high demand, low levels of wind and corresponding tight conditions in Great Britain. Had the second north-south interconnector been present, security supply in Northern Ireland would have been substantially stronger, with power from excess capacity across the same able to be transported to Northern Ireland. The second north-south line, along with the introduction of the Greenlink and Celtic interconnectors, are expected to strongly improve security supply in both jurisdictions as these assets come online in the next few years. My officials are working to ensure that the benefits of these connections are available to consumers here in terms of both lower prices and security of supply. The calculation of adequacy for the purposes of forecasting by the systems operator deploys a 4.9-hour loss of load expectation standard in Northern Ireland and an 8-hour loss of load expectation standard in the Republic of Ireland. An 8-hour loss of load expectation is used for the same capacity options, which also seeks to procure local capacity when and where it is necessary in the absence of, insufficient, of sufficient interconnection. And I call Steve Egan. Thank you very much indeed. May I thank the ministers for our answers so far, and indeed from the questions from my, my hon. Friend from North Antrim. There is indeed a question of base load capacity within Northern Ireland that needs to be identified. But the question, Minister, is the fact that under the Northern Ireland Protocol, there are significant issues with the ISEM and the use of electricity trading, particularly across the east-west links. Could the Minister explain to us what discussions she's had, particularly with Michael Gove, to make sure there's an equitable use of the east-west interconnection process, to make sure we're not over-reliant on just the north-south or very limited base load capacity in Northern Ireland? Again, can I thank the member um, who brings up uh, an interesting and important um, question on the impact of the, North, North, the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, on the SEM and indeed on uh, capacity. Um, can I answer in the general um, at first 
um, which is, is really to say that the Northern Ireland Protocol in this uh, instance has provided the level playing field necessary for the continuation of the single electricity market. Um, and one inevitable consequence of EU access is the loss to European platforms of cross-border trading in electricity. As a result, um, trading between the SEM and GB has moved to baseline arrangements which are less um, efficient and, and, and more difficult. The market operator reports that the changeover to the new arrangements has gone smoothly. All systems are working well. The full impact of the change in the GB SEM trading arrangements is still being assessed, but it is clear that, as expected, the loss of efficiency is placing an upward pressure on prices. I call Cahill Boylan. Hey, thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for answer so far. Minister, just in relation to, and sorry, in the context of an economic recovery strategy, um, decarbonisation needs to be a priority. So, in the development of the new energy strategy, will the Minister ensure that community owned energy projects are supported and facilitated to provide opportunities for local groups and develop proposals on projects to support the local community through renewable energy itself? Can I thank uh, the member for his question? Um, and we are well on our way to, um, I hope, in the late spring of this year, uh, producing um, our consultation paper on our new energy strategy for Northern Ireland, which I hope will be a catalyst uh, not just for energy efficiency, but also for that green growth recovery that Northern Ireland requires and indeed many of its citizens expect. Um, I want to see a wide-ranging um, consultation, including those with local communities um, and their contribution uh, to the decarbonisation uh, of energy within Northern Ireland. And therefore, I hope that the member will um, take this out, the consultation to his local community so that we can talk to people uh, about how we can together uh, decarbonise energy for the future, and in doing so, not just create a more sustainable environment and climate uh, for Northern Ireland, but also produce jobs uh, and uh, prosperity. And I call Michelle Magalveen. Question three. Thank you um, for the, the question. And Mr. Speaker, with your permission, could I group uh, questions 3, 4 and 12? And again, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I would like to avail of an extra minute uh, to answer this. I have always been clear that despite extensive business preparedness activity here in Northern Ireland, a lack of detail on trading arrangements after the end of the transmission period would impact our economy. Late clarity in the operation of the protocol and the UK-EU trade and cooperation agreement has left businesses in a difficult position, and this has been exacerbated by COVID restrictions. I remain concerned with the lack of preparedness by GB suppliers for customs requirements for goods destined for Northern Ireland, leading to disruption to the haulage and logistics sector and difficulties with supply chains. Late guidance on parcel deliveries has led to firms suspending deliveries to Northern Ireland, although many have since resumed. Over the last number of days, I have been working with my Westminster colleagues and industry representatives. Uh, and I'm glad to report that we have found a resolution to the issue of steel, which, if 25% tariffs had been implemented, would have decimated our local manufacturing economy. I continue uh, to work uh, with government uh, to secure wider clarity and guidance on the complex situation with at-risk goods, rules of origins, tariffs, and importantly, and little talked about by our government, um, the reimbursement scheme that has been promised. I will continue to engage with uh, our government on all of these issues and also welcome uh, the reintroduction of the VAT margin scheme for second-hand cars. 
However, I am mindful that many of the mitigations that have been found are short-term and require longer-term solutions. Every option should be explored here, including that of Article 16 of the Protocol. My Department continues to provide guidance and support to businesses navigating the new trading environment and continues to offer support through InvestNI and Intertrade Ireland. Despite these challenges, I remain ambitious for our economy. I want to ensure that we can resolve issues, seize opportunities for growth within our own UK internal market, secure uh, foreign direct investment and increase exports uh, to the rest of the world. Michelle McElveen, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank the Minister for her answer and welcome the resolution to the issues around steel, which is critical for manufacturing in Northern Ireland. Last Wednesday, the Infrastructure Committee heard from a delegation of haulage sector representatives about the challenges that they are facing as a consequence of the implementation of the protocol. And they were united in their call for the simplification of the systems now being imposed. Can the Minister give an assurance that she will use her influence to articulate these views with the relevant HMG departments and those in a position to bring forward easements to allow trade to resume to a level which is required for Northern Ireland? Again, can I thank uh, the member uh, for her question. Um, I have been meeting uh, with members from the haulage uh, industry in Northern Ireland and they report significant uh, and ongoing problems. Some of these problems, as I have said at my first um, answer, are related to the lack of preparedness by GB businesses who simply are unprepared for the level of paperwork that is now required for that um, access between uh, parts of the United Kingdom's internal market. This, um, they report that while trade is flowing reasonably well between Northern Ireland and GB, because of this lack of preparedness, they are left at times with empty, load, empty lorries to be brought back um, and a significant cost to the consumer. And Mr. Speaker, one of the things that I have uh, warned against in speaking about the protocol on many, many occasions in this House and in other places um, is the fact that the protocol would bring uh, more cost, less choice and more difficulties uh, for the United Kingdom's internal market and its interaction here in Northern Ireland. Indeed, last week I spoke with my colleagues from Scotland, Wales and the new business minister, uh, Paul Scully. And we are going to have a dedicated conversation around this particular issue because we need to resolve this, particularly since, as I said in my previous answer, many of the mitigations are short term and will come back and visit us over and over again unless we find those long term solutions and our hauliers and logistics industry must be part of that solution. Nicole Roy Beggs. Question number four. That's supplementary to your it's questions. Just... Grouped. Oh, it's... <laughs> Apologies. Um, the Northern Ireland Protocol has resulted in significant additional costs. Uh, some suppliers are choosing not to supply Northern Ireland some are not able to supply Northern Ireland, I'm thinking of seed suppliers, um, plant suppliers, animal product suppliers. Uh, and there is concern that in the future the requirement for uh, vets and animal health inspectors to sign off goods uh, and, and food items in particular, that they will not be able to do so on a timely basis. So my question to the Minister is, are you and the executive as a whole collectively leaving the past behind, the past battles behind, and moving to try and find collective solutions by engaging with the, the, uh, Her Majesty's Government, the EU, the Joint Committee, the Joint Committee Working Group to get practical working outcomes, simplification, so that trade can continue and costs can be kept to a minimum? The member raises a really pertinent point and one, again, um, I will repeat for this House. For those parties in this House who call for the full implementation of the protocol, we are now seeing what that full implementation, or shall I say, rigorous implementation now looks like. And it looks like 
greater cost, less choice, more bureaucracy for our firms as they do business with uh, our biggest market. I have said over and over again in my department and on uh, behalf uh, of uh, my party that my greatest challenge is to ensure that we are able to do trade within the United Kingdom's internal market, which is our greatest market, the market where we do more trade um, than with um, the Republic of Ireland, the rest of Europe and the rest of the world all added together. That is crucial for Northern Ireland's prosperity um, and for all sectors of our economy. I therefore um, would uh, indicate also to the member that, as he knows, I have been working on issues of second-hand cars, on steel, on a wide variety of issues to bring practical solutions to this most difficult of issues. And the, the time is up um, for list of questions, and I move to topical questions. And I call on Justin McNulty. McNulty. Minister, the delays in paying out the support schemes have been hugely frustrating for businesses and families. Despite the welcome furlough scheme, there are still costs for businesses to retain staff and there are serious cash flow issues. Does the Minister agree that if she does not get the financial support out the door urgently, businesses will be at risk of going to the wall and will be forced to make redundancies and let workers go? And I uh, thank the member for his question. And uh, may I just remind the House that uh, during this pandemic, my department um, has made available to businesses um, I'm by now almost 400 million uh, in support of tens of thousands of businesses within Northern Ireland. We are currently working uh, on a range of schemes um, for. Um, businesses in Northern Ireland, including the COVID restriction support scheme, um, the tourism schemes, um, and a, a range of other schemes. I understand that businesses need to have uh, their finance also um, in a timely uh, fashion um, and um, will uh, continue to push Invest Northern Ireland to make sure that that happens. Um, but I would also remind the member that there are many other schemes across government um, for financial support for businesses not administered by my department. Just McNulty, supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for her answer. And whilst I welcome that there being financial payments made to numerous businesses, judging by the volume of issues being raised with me on a daily basis from businesses who are on their hands and knees seeking payments, it doesn't ring true. Can the Minister Tell me of how she intends to produce, uh, tell me if she intends to produce a comprehensive COVID-19 recovery plan and outline how she will seek to rebuild and reboot our economy and get people back to work. We are currently working on um, a recovery plan in conjunction with uh, other executive colleagues. Um, the member will be aware that as of the latest figures, around 68,000 people in Northern Ireland still remain on furlough. And therefore, I would suggest that one of the things that, um, and indeed I have already done it, but the executive may well feel uh, that they should do it, is to write uh, to our national government to ensure that those national support schemes, like the job retention scheme, continue, particularly for sectors like aerospace and hospitality, where I believe that the tail of recovery will be longer. I am also working on a specific and tailored plan for the Northern Ireland economy. In that, I want us uh, not just uh, to look um, at um, the, the here and now, but I want us to look at the economy uh, of the next 10 years in Northern Ireland, where we see the opportunities um, and how we see uh, the economy developing. Crucial to all of this, and something that I will be bidding for funding for, will be a dedicated skills fund for Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is the only part of the United Kingdom that now spends less on skills than it did in 2012. We need to re, uh, uh, rebalance that 
equation. And we need to understand that for us to have economic recovery, then we need the skills to match that recovery, and we need to be flexible and urgent in bringing forward those skills uh, and the, the schemes for that. And I look forward to the member's support when I uh, ask for funding for a dedicated skills fund for Northern Ireland. I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, you will know from uh, during your question time and the questions that were laid down the various issues that are facing students, and we know housing was one of them, but there are other issues as well. Can I ask um, what discussions you have had with our local universities about additional support for students? Again, um, can I thank uh, the member uh, for her question? I have been, um, as I said previously uh, on this occasion, speaking with uh, the Vice Chancellors of both Queen's and uh, Ulster University. Um, and I want to ensure that what we're doing for universities um, is appropriate for students and meets the needs of students. So therefore, we need to look at the hardship fund, how that hardship fund uh, is administered, and if there are relaxations that we can bring to bear on that hardship fund. This morning, I also spoke with the universities around issues of mental health and how we can continue to support students who sadly um, are reporting um, increased need uh, in this particular area. And perhaps something that hasn't received um, a lot of um, conversation in this particular question time is the issue uh, of providing data for students who now have to conduct much of their courses online. We are looking at all of those issues and will bring forward a package in due course. Paula Bradley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answer? Um, uh, Minister, you raised some very valid points there, especially around mental health, and we are hearing through our constituency offices just how this is affecting our students. We also meant it there about the, the hardship fund, and we know with all of these funds there are criteria, and criteria is quite limited. Um, so can you give us your assurance that you will speak to the universities to say about broadening that criteria to encompass more people um, to receive this hardship fund? Yes, I think that one of the things um, we need to look at is how more people uh, can access the Hardship Fund and how more students know about the Hardship Fund and how to apply. So I will be working with the universities over the next uh, short period uh, to look at those issues and also with student uh, representatives uh, to hear their views on this as well. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, uh, late last year, I think about four months ago, you made an announcement about help for apprentices, and yet uh, there's been uh, very little, if any, money paid out. I think out of the uh, challenge fund, there's been nothing paid out as yet, and in the other uh, out of the 197 applications to the new Apprentice Recruitment Incentive Scheme, only 32 payments have been made. Uh, Minister, are you aware of where the problems are and how are you, do you intend to fix them to ensure that these hard-pressed young people and businesses get the support they so desperately need? Can I thank the member for bringing forward this question? Because this is one of the things that I think is hugely important for young people, but also for the future of the Northern Ireland economy. I would like to see us place value in our apprenticeship system. I would like to see increases in, um, for example, all age apprenticeships, um, and over the next uh, year we'll be bringing forward to set the pathway for all of those things, because I think apprenticeships um, offer real opportunities for uh, young people. Our apprenticeship um, fund um, was to do two, three things. One was to retain those apprentices um, that uh, were in the system uh, on furlough but in danger of not returning to work. The extension of the furlough scheme has somewhat um, clouded that ambition on that particular issue because those young, many of those young apprentices remain on furlough. And as I said earlier in this uh, debate, around 68,000 people in Northern Ireland remain uh, within uh, the job retention scheme run by our national government. The Challenge Fund is currently working its way through those proposals um, and uh, will have an outcome reasonably soon. And we hope to continue to work with um, employers 
in a most difficult environment to look at how we can create new opportunities for apprentices, because I do believe that they are hugely, hugely important. Can I say as well, for those young people who are um, worried um, about, and many of these young apprentices will of course take vocational um, exams, um, I did uh, take the step last week uh, of making sure that vocational exams were cancelled. I have asked um, our own exam uh, regulator to bring forward proposals for those Northern Ireland based exams by the end of February and the start of March for the national ones. Dolores Kelly, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, I think we are agreed on the importance of value in apprenticeships and vocational training. Nonetheless, uh, whilst I accept there may well be some young people and businesses using the furlough scheme, that nonetheless, there are several applicants, over 197, and only 32 have received uh, any help. So, what are you doing in, within your department to fix that? Because if they wouldn't apply uh, to the scheme if they were on furlough. So, there's something obviously wrong within the department. I, of course, will come back to the member with the precise details uh, on this particular issue and will write to you about them. But can I say, in general, this is a priority for me within the department and we intend to work through it. I call Cara Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister uh, for being here today, uh, as I have a question of real concern. Um, as mentioned by my colleagues earlier, the SDLP uh, surveyed hundreds of students this week about their experience throughout the pandemic, and results have been really quite harrowing, with 79% of students saying they have been excluded from financial support. Given a one-off payment of £500 to every Northern Ireland student would cost approximately £32 million, just a fraction of the £105 million your department has handed back, will the Minister commit to introducing a support fund for students? Well, as I've reiterated uh, on, on a number of occasions today and in answer to a number of questions today, I have been in touch with the student loan company to see if they can facilitate um, any uh, of these uh, particular uh, issues. I must say that I was disappointed in their response, uh, but I will continue to pursue that conversation with uh, the student loan company uh, on that particular issue. In the meantime, I have also been speaking to the Vice Chancellors of Queen's and Ulster to see what more universities can do in order uh, to um, help students at a difficult and really harrowing time uh, in their uh, education. Supplementary, Carl Hunter. Thank you, Minister. Minister, your respect, when we talk about students, we're talking about real people, real problems, real worries, real bills and real stress. With 94% of our students surveyed, they said the pandemic has negatively impacted their well-being. And while I respect you've had at length discussions with student loan companies and vice chancellors, talking is not enough. As a former student myself and as an MLA, I'd like to ask the Minister, does she intend to abdicate responsibility and blame everyone else or commit today to helping our students financially? I fear the member hasn't quite been listening to the whole conversation here uh, in the chamber today in that I've already committed to bringing forward a package in relation to the issue. Uh, Robbie Butler. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I didn't think I would get him with the time. Minister, you will be aware of significant delays for business in desperate need for the second payment of the CRBSS grant. This is being compounded by a void of communication. What plan do you have to improve communication to businesses? Um, Invest uh, Northern Ireland do have a dedicated helpline, uh, which I know that they uh, are working through. Uh, with um, members uh, who have applied uh, for the particular grant. Um, I hope that payments will go out um, very, very soon in relation to that. But in the meantime, I would remind the House that uh, the, this particular grant, not as, uh, it's not as large a fund as the local restrictions grant uh, run by the Finance Department, has already paid out £17.5 million to individual businesses in Northern Ireland to help them through the pandemic. And just this morning, I was signing off a bid for further funding for this um, so that we can continue to make the payments right up to the end of the 5th of March. 
And members' time is up. And could I ask members to take a raise for a moment or two, please? Thank you.